So I think one of the themes that we got out of today's uh, uh, event already is that the attack vector is really starting to shift. I mean, historically, and I understand that you guys are dealing with legacy systems, so the issues of vulnerabilities and patching is very significant. But, but what we're seeing, and I think what you will see as well if you're not experiencing already, is that the attack vector is shifting to users and their credentials. And so uh, last year, Verizon, their data breach report, said that two-thirds of all, com of all uh, breaches had to do with compromised credentials. And about a year ago, I was talking to Kevin Mandia, who's now the uh, CEO of FireEye, and uh, he was part of a group called Mandiant. They go, they go in there and they do, when a bad, something bad happens at an organization, they send a SWAT team in there. And he, he told me that actually 100% of all the breaches involved uh, compromised credentials, increasingly more and more with privileged identities. And so uh, I'm gonna give you my perspective on you know, what's needed to, to harden the workforce. And I can speak personally, I'm CEO of a 500 person company. Every week, I'm personally attacked in some way. So I have seen so many different variants of people creating different domains with Centrify. So we have people have created domains with Centrify with an L or a one here or a three as opposed to an E. So that happens probably once every couple weeks that there, someone creates a domain, a lookalike domain, and tries to fool people within my organization. A year or two ago, someone sent an email to someone in accounting and figured out the org structure with this set of emails. The first email was for me asking to wire $350,000, okay? Um, and that happens all the time. I personally get a Facebook request from very nice looking young women um, <laughs> that I've never gone to Tennessee State. I have no affiliation with that, um, but uh, there's attempts to that. Uh, my wife, they figure out who my wife is. She's actually been targeted as well to try to get to me as well. So here I am as a CEO of, um, granted it's a cybersecurity company. We do a lot of business with government and uh, large organizations. But just imagine that uh, your head of uh, your department, uh, cabinet members, et cetera, just the level of sophistication. In an article about the OPM breach in Wired magazine, I'm quoting Wired, they said that China in the army has 100,000 people dedicated to cyber attacks, okay? It is so easy for them to assign 20 or 30 individuals within US government, industry, et cetera, for them to go and attack and target as well. So what you'll see here today for me is, is just give you some examples and some, some of my thoughts um, on how to best protect yourself given that the attack vector is focusing really on the weakest link. So you can, you can modernize your technology, but your weakest link in the end is actually your people and whether or not they can be socially engineered to give away their password. Because oftentimes if you can get someone's password, you can literally walk through the front door. So no matter you know, how much technology and processes, um, oftentimes the weakest link is credential. The second part of the title right there is securing a boundaryless organization. So we heard talk about movement to the cloud. And so cloud and mobile offers some real interesting challenges. And so in a world in which your users within your organizations are increasingly using their iPhone, their iPad, their Android device, say at a Starbucks here at Pentagon City to access cloud applications, the old way of going about securing are no longer applicable. You probably don't have antivirus on your phone. You're probably not VPNing to the corporate or the uh, government uh, enterprise uh, network to access that information, right? And so in that environment, what can you focus on in securing? And so again, I'm gonna posit that the focus needs to shift to the user. Is it really me at Starbucks doing that? Preferably, I'm not typing a password to actually get because someone could be right next to me filming me typing my password. Uh, I should be leveraging biometrics to actually validate if it's actually me. And preferably, I'm actually doing behavior and analytics as well. Wait a minute, Tom, 
is now uh, at Pentagon City accessing various cloud applications, Office 365. But five minutes later, he's trying to office, uh, access Office 365 from China. I don't think that should happen. So there also needs to be a focus in terms of actually looking at behavior uh, and doing behavior analytics as well. So those are some of the, the topics that I'm gonna cover today. And so specifically from my agenda, I'm gonna give you my perspective on the top two government breaches in 2016, 2015, okay? And you've, you've obviously heard about these, but I'll just give you uh, a guy from California's take uh, in terms of what I see has happened. I'm gonna drill down a little bit more details in, in terms of what the root of the problems and actually give some real uh, recommendation and, and, and discuss some real world results. So the top two breaches, which are probably the top two breaches, you know, actually, you know, not, I mean, so you could probably add Yahoo breach, uh, but that ha started probably about 2013, 2014. But these are probably the, the top two breaches industry-wide, which was, and I'm lumping the first ones together, the DNC and Podesta hack, and then the OPM. And so the interesting thing is, is that, you know, in reading about this and, and, and talking with my peers in the industry, it was a very targeted attack. They, they targeted thousands of individuals. It wasn't just a handful as well. And we were able to figure what actually happened and who was targeted because bit.ly links were sent, shortened URLs. And so you could actually see which accounts were actually targeted, okay? And the URLs, the bit.ly links redirected to uh, spoof Google domains where people would actually log in and then at that point give up their credentials. And from there, they gained access to Google Apps as well as personal Gmail um, and Google Drives as well. And so obviously we all know what the, the impact uh, was uh, with respect to the election, uh, et cetera. One of the more interesting emails that came out uh, in, from WikiLeaks was uh, this email, we've been compromised, but it's all okay. Uh, here's the new password. And here was a email sharing the password. I don't know what it was for, probably uh, you know, some Google Drive, some documents, et cetera. And so great example of identity in terms of you know, people also not only have easy to break uh, passwords or have passwords that are easily stolen, but we also have a situation right here where people are actually sharing passwords as well. So what can we learn from this? I think from organizationally that I think it's clear that uh, there's a significant inadequacy having to do with relying on passwords. And so especially from an organizational perspective, there are modern technologies that exist, such as SAML, where you actually don't have passwords for specific applications, that you leverage a common identity provider, where then you can layer on additional levels of security, including enforcing multi-factor authentication. So in, in this particular case, they were using Google Apps, they were having everyone have just individualized usernames and passwords and actually not leveraging multi-factor authentication. And even though Google itself, if you use the Gmail, actually has MFA as well. And it turns out there's actually uh, websites that are out there that you can leverage as both from an organizational perspective for your agencies, but also on a personal basis that have gone out there, sucked up all the stolen usernames and passwords so that you could see that if your uh, username has been uh, part of any uh, websites that have been hacked like Forbes uh, and some of the other ones as well. In addition, that you could actually, if you have domain privileges, you can see if what accounts have actually uh, been taken from your actual domain itself as well. And then of course individuals, um, and actually this is, good, this is a good question. So I am now going to have, can you put up that, uh, the first um, poll? Why don't we flip to that poll question? And so the first poll question is, uh, has your organization implemented MFA across the entire organization? So why don't we see the poll results happen in real time? So are you, are you close to 100%? So if people can do that. Okay, we got a yes, we got some no's here, right here. 
Actually, it's too bad we don't see how many people are actually. So it looks like right now we're at 50-50 so far here as well. So it looks like about half the organizations fully have MFA across the board as well. Um, yeah, going up, yes, no, no, all right, that's good, 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 that's good. All right, so we're now at two thirds. Okay, we'll come back and take a look at the final results as well right there, so that's good. Oh, no, we could sit here all day look, looking at this right here. All right, so go back to my slides, please. So the key thing is obviously all of us as individuals because oftentimes the hackers are going after our personal accounts to eventually get into our work accounts. And so we should also fully implement MFA across the board. Okay. And then the other thing is don't share the passwords, especially don't email them. Okay, let's take a look at Podesta. So here, actually, by looking at the Bitly links, we actually, and looking at what we're looking at the WikiLeaks post, here was the actual email that Podesta actually got. And so <coughs> someone has your password. Notice it says the location is Ukraine, okay? So he actually forwarded it to IT. This is, this is something bad happened here where the IT person meant to type illegitimate, but he typed legitimate and then the world changed uh, because of that. Um, and so, and then this is the actual website he went to. So again, you could actually have seen this from Bitly uh, right here. It's now been taken down, but this is what he actually saw. And so look at the sophistication that they actually created this website with his picture, his email. It looked legit. And you had to look very carefully at the URL to actually see uh, it was not actually a Google account. And it looks like, so he did change his password, and he also used the same password for the tw Twitter account. One thing, uh, one myth that I, that I heard coming out was that uh, a couple people did, said that his password for his Gmail account was password one. That's false. You, you cannot, it, the Gmail will not allow a, the password to be password one, so that's kind of a myth. It doesn't help the cause when people actually say that like Gmail allows bad passwords for that as well. It gives us an e gives an easy excuse to kind of laugh off something like that. And as I said before, uh, that it, the IT tech guy actually meant to uh, type illegitimate right there. So what can we learn? Uh, again, it goes back to a password. Um, we actually, Centrify, uh, we've signed up to be a sponsor of Stop, Think, Connect. Uh, they have the lockdown your login. I think this is a great idea. Hopefully, there could be further evangelism of the cyber safety belt of adding multi-factor authentication. But I think the other thing is, and I see this within our own organization as well, that there's a reliance too much on IT to use to reply back via email to security problems, right? You should pick up the phone. If someone calls you and says that there's a security issue or security breach, you need to pick up the phone and actually call a person because you don't actually know that you're communicating to the actual person that's having trouble. You could be actually be communicating to the actual hacker itself. All right, so then in 2015, another significant breach, as we're very well aware, was OPM. So 20 million, and probably a lot of us here uh, probably had our personnel files uh, stolen, and so this information pretty significant in terms of social security, fingerprint information, background check information, uh, et cetera. And the uh, at the time, the FBI pointed a finger to the nation uh, to a nation state, and since then, it actually has been specifically pointed out it was the Chinese. It started through a contractor. Uh, credentials being, and so the actual contractor was initially targeted in late 2014, uh, and then through that contractor that the Chinese were able to actually get administrator privileges, um, and in the end, uh, there was a key server, which was a jump box that was infiltrated uh, where the data and the records uh, were able to be uh, taken and uploaded to a uh, site called opmsecurity.org, a, a fake uh, domain name, and then from there. And so there was an issue with not only privileged identity management, 
but that one of the bigger laps was the fact that uh, PIV cards had not yet been implemented at OPM at the time as well. So it was a privilege problem, but it was also a um, lack of multi-factor authentication. Again, another theme being you know, lack of MFA. Uh, and so this is a quote um, uh, from the DOI. It was the compromised credentials. So I think the key thing that what we really need to learn from this is that when we look at our workforce, we need to start segmenting the different types of accounts that we have and also try to identify which are the ones that have the greatest amount of risk. And so in the end, the accounts that actually can do the most amount of damage if they were to be compromised are privileged user accounts. And so that is, in the end, what the hackers are increasingly going after, okay? And so, and then from there, it's end user accounts, which is employees, contractors, uh, et cetera. And then uh, lesser priority are potentially partner accounts, contractors that may have limited access, and that from there, actually, your end customers' accounts as well. It's almost a kind of a, a curve right there in terms of the level of damage. So when you look at your workforce, there needs to be a natural segmentation in terms of which accounts could actually have the most amount of risk associated with them as well. So at the end of the day, I think what you're seeing with these high-profile breaches is that the root of the problem is, is that we have an identity problem. And the identity problem ranges from, you know, the ranges from passwords in terms of them being stolen, them being weak, them being shared. We heard the old the sharing with the Excel uh, spreadsheet of all the accounts for the, uh, the accounting system, right? We have a lack of MFA. It really needs to be everywhere. But we also have a lack of, of implementing the concept of least privilege. So if you actually read the uh, joint analysis report that came out recently with the, uh, the Russian hacking of uh, various uh, parties and individuals, there was a big focus actually on the whole concept of least privilege and what needs to be done there as well. I, I highly recommend uh, everyone reading that. And then the final thing is, which often you know, often it gets forgotten is that whole concept of business email compromise where there actually isn't malware, there actually isn't the stealing of, of someone's credentials. It's you receiving an email from someone that you think is legitimate and you acting upon that. And what happens in businesses is that it's increasingly the CEO or the CFO being targeted. Um, actually, it's more the CFO or people in accounting being targeted with this urgent email from me, the CEO, saying, you need to wire this data, I mean, this, uh, you need to wire these, these funds um, to this bank account. And because people are so used to having someone like myself ask for something, there's no questions asked. And now we've seen this actually shift towards other types of information, other data. And so about a year ago that uh, the, someone, the CEO sent, the CEO of Snap, who's about to go public, sent an email to the head of HR asking for all W-2 information. Uh, and it was sent, and it turned out it was, actually wasn't the CEO, but it was uh, a bad person, and so a year and a half ago, all the social security and, and uh, salary information for all the employees of SNAP uh, was sent out as well. And so we also have a situation uh, in which it's not actually about stealing credentials, hacking credentials, least privilege, it's just people, social engineering individuals to get them to do things um, and and frankly, people deem it, even after the fact, they don't even realize that, uh, that things like uh, doing a wire transfer actually happened as well. So what I'm trying to get across here is really consider identity as really kind of that new perimeter that needs to be secured, especially in a world in which the actual traditional perimeter uh, is disappearing in a world of cloud and mobile, et cetera. 
So what are some specific recommendations and uh, real world results? Um, and so one way that I like to look at things from an internal but also talking with our customers is the fact that we have a problem. We have too many passwords. We have too much privilege. And so what can you do to go actually go about address that? And so we, we have a number of steps that can be taken. The first step, and it sounds like, especially coming out of uh, Tony Scott's uh, sprint from two years ago, and two of the four actually had to do with identity, one of which was uh, introducing, uh, actually continuing the whole uh, PIV deployment and a CAC card deployment, et cetera, is try to implement MFA everywhere. And I think just the recent examples of what we saw with DNC and Podesta really emphasize that. I think the other thing that we need to look for is whether or not you can actually consolidate identities. Can you actually get, reduce the number of usernames and passwords, leveraging single sign-on, leveraging uh, protocols such as SAML or in for uh, more legacy applications, leveraging Kerberos, where you don't actually have as many passwords out there as well. The next step is limit lateral movement. And that in can include, uh, obviously, network segmentation, uh, removing or reducing the need for VPN inning. But the other thing is, is that there really needs to be better integration between identity and access with your workflow. So if you're using a product such as ServiceNow or thinking about something like that, that for any access, it should be, there should be levels of approval that need to be gone through. And so what we see is that oftentimes people don't have that approval uh, and this, they allow people carte blanche to be able to access systems, et cetera. There needs to be workflow, approval levels, uh, et cetera, integrated in with identity and access control. We talked about enforcing the concept of least privilege. Uh, and then finally, there needs to be, again, as I alluded to before, there not only needs to be monitoring of log files that, that uh, are associated with devices, systems, and applications, but there also needs to be user level auditing to be behavior analytics uh, as well. So those are the steps that, that we recommend. Um, and we actually did a recent survey um, about this. We work with a uh, analyst organization called Forrester um, and asked people in terms of, have you recently experienced a breach? And uh, this was off the record. We talked to CISOs and CIOs of very large organizations. And the answer was yes, that, that uh, two thirds of the organizations actually reported uh, five or more data breaches within the last few years. And then we started drilling down in terms of best practices. And what we actually found using that same model that I talked about, which is implementing multi-factor authentication, moving to single sign-on, least privilege, having workflow and approval, et cetera. And we actually found that the more mature organizations were, um, the less number of breaches that they actually experience. So there's actually a methodology from an identity access control perspective that you can follow, much like at a high level that I described, that actually can result in meaningful uh, reduction of breaches, as well as improvements in terms of productivity, the adoption of new technology uh, as well. So I'm getting the end sign back there, uh, right there. So uh, why don't we go to the last uh, poll before I close right here. And while that's brought up, uh, we're going to have some really good learning hubs. So the question is, what was the cause of the DNC? This is a, this is a test to see if you guys actually paid attention. So uh, what was the cause of DNC breach? Was it human error, phishing attack, lack of MFA, all of the above? So, so far, we got 100% all of the above right there. But again, it's this is not a simple you know, issue of just throwing MFA out there. It, you need to have a comprehensive plan in terms of the ways that you can actually further harden the workforce. So that's it. I don't have anything else. Is there a uh, segue or transition before we go to the learning hubs? And we have about 50 people so far in that, so I think people are paying attention. Okay, good. That's good. I like all of the above. So please help me to um, thank me, Tom. All right, thank you very much.